So firstly, I'd like to thank you so much for the invitation to join the City Makers Conference discussion on good and smart growth and to be able to share my thoughts on this topic. There is so much to talk about, so many lenses through which one can tackle the issues we face in our cities. And for me, the past decade has focused on the belief that good design properly applied to our built environment can be transformational in improving the quality of our lives. I've done this through all of my roles, first and foremost as one of the founders of DRMM Architects, and latterly as a National Infrastructure Commissioner, a board member of Homes England, and an advisor to the Mayor of London, and most recently as founder and chair of the Quality of Life Foundation. And it's because of the work and research that the Foundation has undertaken through the last year, before and throughout the pandemic, that it's through the lens of belonging that I will frame my talk. From long before the COVID-19 pandemic, the theme of belonging has been central to my design philosophy. This year has only augmented a belief that well-designed places can bring people together, give them a sense of purpose and control, and measurably impact their health and soundness of mind. My education around how places can support inclusivity and belonging stretches far back beyond the past few decades. It began in my childhood. I was brought up in a family that challenged the norm, although like most of us, you never know at the time. My family lived and rented an apartment in a commune set up by my grandfather. Beginning in the late 1940s, three families collected the equivalent cost of a home and with that combined money were able to buy a large house, many of which were sold cheaply after the war. The original agreement had one room per person. Families had half apartments, but moved around as they increased or decreased in size. Single residents shared bathrooms and kitchens and a nursery was set up to allow single mothers to work. And after a while, dedicated offices were also built so occupants could work from home. Living communally taught me many things, from the value of sharing to the worth of both the older and younger generations, as well as the importance of looking after others. Alongside my fellow neighbours, I cooked for my elderly neighbour during my slot, which happened to be every Sunday night, where in most situations, this elderly woman I was looking after would have to go into her care, but our community was able to support her allowing her to live a fulfilled and happy life. And in return for my cooking and care, she read stories to my daughters. Aside from sharing space, amenities and activities, St. Julian's also implicitly became a place for challenging stigma and learning to embrace members of community that were different to you or your family. My grandfather was a psychiatrist and in quite radical practice, would have his patients come and stay with St. Julian's while they went, underwent treatment. I therefore grew up with the awareness of mental health issues and by extension in the company of people whose society had classified as different. This taught me a lot about how physical places can work to heal and create social ties where they otherwise would not exist. But what does a sense of belonging really mean? And how does that differ depending on age, gender, ethnicity, and more importantly, how as architects and designers can we help shape the cities and developments to encourage better social cohesion, neighborliness, or ultimately help to improve the quality of our lives? And how do we do that in a positive way, a way that recognizes the role of design in improving development and delivering quality of life in an ever denser city? So what do we mean by quality of life? Well, this was a question that rose to prominence when the UK central government became more and more focused on the aesthetics of our home, with populist arguments resurfing around traditional versus modern, and with the quality of nose builds, new, <laughs> new builds nose diving, I wondered how we could realign the debate. And at the end of last year, I set up the Quality of Life Foundation with an aim to raise people's quality of life. We want to do this by making well-being central to the way we create and care for our homes and communities. Active, participatory and people-led research is a big part of how we implement our goal. Our nationwide survey, Quality of Life at Home, commissioned before lockdown but continued through the pandemic, 
has given us a unique insight into what people feel is important to their homes and communities. The importance of local relationships cannot be overstated. It's through their local community that residents experience well-being. Local facilities such as parks, shops, schools and pubs give people the daily routines that ground their lives. And bedrooms, kitchens and living rooms need to be designed in ways that allow these spaces to play multiple functions and accommodate different users. And the flexible design of private and communal gardens, gardens and porches should take into account the need for socialising with your neighbours. And our relationships with people we feel close to, co-production, active engagement and open planning are essential to increase residents' quality of life. And the built environment impacts on the quality of our life at different scales. We must remember that, not just only as individuals, but through the local neighbourhood and, and as a result of regional and national policies and trends, which is why design and planning are essential solution to improve residents' quality of life. But many times they need to be complemented by broader policy strategies, which is why we need to make people's well-being central to government policy. We've been using our research to work towards a framework of quality of life principles that can be applied to placemaking to ensure living is defined by well-being. And last but not least, we identified the theme of belonging as one of the major touchstones to quality of life. So what does best practice look like in 2020? What are cities in the UK aspiring to when it comes to improving our health and well-being, tackling lack of social cohesion, integration and climate change? Well, it's the first co-housing scheme in one of the UK's largest cities that has won a string of awards for its innovative and progressive approach. I can't help but have a sense of deja vu. Marmalade Lane shows the importance in new housing developments of greater local participation, increased opportunities for accessing nature, and the prioritization of people over cars. Its design has helped create a place with a genuine sense of belonging and a rich local culture that harnesses the humor and warmth that are so vital in these challenging times. The development comprises of 42 homes, a mix of two to five bedroom houses, and one and two bedroom apartments. But it's Marmalade Lane's shared spaces and communal facilities that are designed to foster community spirit and sustainable living. These include extensive shared gardens as the focal space of the community with areas of for growing food, play, socializing, quiet and contemplation, and a flexible common house with a playroom, guest rooms, laundry facilities, meeting rooms, and a large and hall and shared kitchen for shared meals and parties. A separate workshop is located elsewhere on site and residents have a stake in the community parts and contribute to the management of this community. Counting 14 different nationalities in their number with ages ranging from nine months to 73 years, the group is an eclectic bunch, attracted for a variety of reasons. And like other co-housing communities have found, there are clear benefits to multi-generational living from sharing childcare to combating isolation. And it is this sense of isolation and loneliness that is becoming an increasing problem in our cities. And surprisingly, it's not the elder generation that is most affected. A study by the Office for National Statistics found that almost 10% of people aged between 16 and 24 were always or often lonely, the highest proportion of any age group. And this was more than three times higher than people aged 65 and over. So young people can have thousands of friends online and yet feel unsupported and isolated. Technology, including social media, could be exasperating social isolation. And in London, we've had a rash of co-living apartment blocks. So can we build communities from scratch would be the question, or does a sense of belonging come from being settled in one place for a longer period of time, over generations, or as cities expand, do we need to embrace the transient nature of a global world? Or has the latest restrictions on travel shown us a different, more localized way to live, where we feel safe and secure over the long term? 
In an ever-changing world, schemes that provide affordable, long-term homes with security of tenure are becoming increasingly important. And over the past few years, there has been a sustained and relentless focus on the need to build new homes. The government set a target of up to 300,000 new homes a year in the UK, a number we're consistently failing to reach. And the mayor's official assessment is now 66,000 new homes a year to provide enough for current and future Londoners. And the focus has only been heightened by the huge economic black hole left by the pandemic and the hope pinned on the industry to build, build, build our way out of it. But we must never forget that houses are homes, homes make a community and communities make a place. We've learned that relentless housing blocks offer few opportunities of nurturing any sense of community, that feelings of place get harder and harder to achieve the denser and higher you build. Yet in the past decade, few areas of housing policy have been as controversial as estate re regeneration. 50 estates with over 30,000 homes have undergone regeneration schemes in London alone. While the total number of homes on those estates has now almost doubled, there has been a net loss of some 8,000 social rented homes. The cost and benefits of each individual scheme have been contested. One of the most divisive questions is whether to, mo to demolish or refurbish the existing homes. The trade-offs associated with demolishing council homes to build a greater quantity of more expensive homes are seen by some as realism and by others as social cleansing. On the other hand, the mayor and the housing providers argue that homes are often in a bad state of repair and that refurbishment would either be too expensive or impractic impractical. And I would argue that their plans to regenerate estates have seen an, a significant increase in overall numbers of homes and point to improvements in living conditions of remaining tenants. My own practice, Dear MM, was involved in one such project. And as the pilot for the regeneration of the notorious Elephant and Castle estate had to deal with a backlash from a community who had consistently been overpromised and underdelivered to. A community who lived in poor conditions but nonetheless felt a huge sense of belonging to their neighbourhood and were frightened of change. Joe Mem have spent the past 20 years designing homes that try to foster a sense of community. If I look back to the six themes within the quality of life framework, then it's a sense of control as well as nurturing a sense of belonging that has led to the success of this particular project. Trafalgar Place is a Sterling Prize shortlisted mixed-use project that followed a core intention to building a neighborhood of inclusivity and belonging right from the start. Delivered as part of the Haygate Estate Regeneration in Elephant and Castle, it comprises 235 tenure blind, high quality homes, including 25% affordable housing, set within a new landscape and an exist of existing mature trees. What it replaces was a Haygate Estate, which over time gave way overwhelming priority to vehicles and created a disconnect between buildings and landscape. By the beginning of the 21st century, the area had become synonymous with heavy traffic, street crime and high density, poor quality housing. And the foundation for the success of a scheme such as this comes from meaningful consultation. When problems occur, as they inevitably do, they're easier to bear if we feel we have a degree of control over our situation. This is true of the home as it is of the neighborhood. And one of the biggest issues that disempowers us is feeling unsafe and vulnerable. A sense of well-being comes from believing that there is something that we and our neighbors can do to improve our area and access lo local problems. And this is particularly important, I think, when major change is planned and when we can be involved through participation and co-design of new developments. And when we were appointed to provide housing as part of the first phase of Elephant and Castle, we wanted to prioritise the creation of varied scale and the return to public space. We created a mixture of mini tower apartments, buildings and townhouses to create a more human scale, in contrast to the 1960s mega blocks of the old estate. Every home has been designed from the inside out, maximising light and space, and each has its own garden, balcony or roof terrace. We prioritised green space 
with Landscape Architects Grant Associates to reconnect the dislocated adjacent neighbourhoods that were previously fractured by the impenetrable hulk of the Haygate estate. The careful retention of 25 mature London plane trees serves as a positive memory of the former estate. We also worked hard to make Trafalgar Place a scheme that could provide homes with a unique sense of identity. The buildings respond to the surrounding context through its scale and colour. Eight types of bricks are used, picking up the hues of the neighbouring buildings. The subtle brickwork detailing relating to context gives the new buildings a playful identity of their own. And creating shared green space and introducing communal areas where people can meet their neighbours and get to know them was central to the project. The one thing that we didn't realise is, uh, is that when it comes to growing courgettes, uh, there can be uh, some neighbourly disputes and the courgette wars broke out uh, um, one, one summer when one of the neighbours was uh, uh, taking all the flowers off the top of the courgette. So it's, it's, uh, it's not always um, uh, a, uh, the, the best way to in, in, engender community spirit. But creating shared green space and, and introducing communal areas where people can meet their neighbours and get, get to know them was central, as I said, to this pro project. We prioritised green and shared space. A new pedestrian street was created through the scheme, which, along with an internal private landscaped courtyard, provided community space for residents to cultivate food and neighbourliness. Projects like Trafalgar Place showcase the ways in which we can build a sense of belonging, sharing and well-being within inner city developments. But in order for these priorities to spread more widely, their focus needs to be felt at a city scale. London's good growth by design sends a signal that these priorities are being championed at higher levels. It is a movement by the mayor to create a city that works for all Londoners calling on built environment professionals and the mayor's design advocates to help make this happen through extensive and diverse implementation. Its intention is to ensure that new development benefits everybody who lives in the city. It speaks directly to the notion of inclusivity. And as with anything else, collaborative support augments effectiveness. In London, various lobby groups are working hard to improve on different aspects of the built environment that support this common drive to make the city a more equitable place. The good growth by design defines growth as the building of more inclusive city and an inviting place to live, work and visit, improving the health and well-being for all Londoners. It also outlines the need for a balanced mix of young and old of people from different cultures and backgrounds, of housing tenures and workplaces. This all rings true with the research we encountered at the Quality of Life Foundation and arguments further the relationship between inclusivity, belonging and design. As a Mayor's Design Advocate, we have been developing the supporting diversity pillar of the Good Growth by Design programme. And this work has been led by the Diversity Sounding Board, which consists of 10 design advocates and six advocate organisations. The Supporting Diversity Handbook is a tool for advocacy, communication and action on the barriers to equality, diversity and inclusion. And it brings together research examples of leadership and recommendations that can be applied at all career stages. But words need to be put into actions and procurement is the first step in getting any project right from the start. And to this end, we have identified opportunities to use the next iteration of the framework to further leverage social value and EDI outcomes. And with the Black Lives Matter movement came a sharp focus on the reality of the here and now, with some London boroughs forced to retender frameworks to include BAME practices on their list. One of the few virtues of living in a pandemic was the ability to understand the role of neighbourhood streets in creating a sense of belonging and inclusivity. Being restricted to daily exercise as our only one form of outing meant that we really got to examine the role of streets and public space and how 
what bearing they have on our day-to-day -day lives. A drive to create healthier streets in the city speaks directly to championing inclusivity. If streets become safer, more inviting and less polluted, then they will conceivably become more inclusive. Research has shown that the majority of non-white communities are more susceptible to illness related to pollution. And this needs to be addressed. And cleaning up our streets is one way of doing this. The quality of life is not just about work and rest, but also play. The playful city is the child-friendly city, but play is not just for kids. It is what we all do when we meet friends of a drink and when we play sport, go to the cinema or bowling alley, walk in the park or ramble in the countryside. Play is what we do with our leisure time and should be woven into the fabric of our towns and cities. An important part of this is child-friendly cities. And in January 2020, as part of the Good Growth by Design programme, the Mayor launched Making London Child-Friendly as a supplementary plan planning guidance on play and recreation. There is, of course, already some brilliant provision for children and young people across London. But at the same time, it's clear that young Londoners face a number of challenges to how they move around the city and access this provision. The increase in youth violence not only blights the lives of victims, perpetrators and their families, but also critically impede the freedom of movement of children and young people to move around independently. Between 1971 and 2010, the number of children in the UK of primary school age allowed to walk to school by themselves fell from 86 to 25%. And we now find ourselves in a situation where nearly 40% of all Londoners are overweight or obese, which can have serious health consequences. As the author Tim Gill suggests, playful cities are not those that provide playgrounds, important as this is, but those where children have freedom to move around and socialise with their peers rather than being in busy roads or the fears of their parents. By strategically planning and designing places and routes for children and young people to be independently mobile with their local areas, the built environment can in increase opportunities for young Londoners to become happier and healthier. School Streets is a pioneering scheme to transform roads outside schools so that only pedestrians and cyclists can use them at school times. One of the effects of COVID and social distancing meant streets outside schools needed to be less congested and safer for our children. Temporary measures have become permanent fixtures outside hundreds of schools in the capital. And research showed that contact with nature on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour and minute-by-minute basis is central to our well-being as humans. Many studies have shown that contact with nature, even just a green view from our window, is good for our mood and aids our recovery when we are ill. And during lockdown, as Londoners, we all became more aware of space, especially green space and the lack of it and the need for it. The Quality of Life Foundation research during the spring of 2020 showed that urban dwellers were less satisfied with their homes than those in the suburbs or rural areas. The Country Land and Business Association around found 44% of Londoners said they were more likely to consider moving to the countryside as a result of COVID. And the lockdowns highlighted how attractive rural life could be to many urban citizens. People value access to nature and residents in some parts of our cities suffer much worse with access to green space. And COVID has made many people realise what is important to their urban lives and they resoundingly want to see change with only 6% of people wanting things to return how they were before the pandemic. But as city dwellers, we need to remind ourselves that you don't need to move to the countryside to experience the benefits of nature on your doorstep, and you don't need huge resource to make it happen. In July 2019, the National Park City Foundation confirmed London as the world's first national park city. From the 20th to the 28th of July, we held the National Park Festival. It was London's largest free celebration of the city's great outdoors and celebrated London becoming the world's first national park city, encouraging Londoners 
to discover the capital's green and blue spaces, improving health, well-being and social cohesion. The festival consisted of 317 free events, which spanned all London boroughs and attracted tens of thousands of Londoners. A range of free activities were available, from paddleboarding and kayaking on the city's waterways, to pedal power, music performance and wildlife photography exhibitions. There were also free plant giveaways and activities for Londoners to get involved in greening their own neighbourhoods. And one of the initiatives was to get London's front gardens back again. The trend to dig out and pave over our front gardens can be traced back to the 1995s, when John Major's government changed the planning rules as car ownership and use rose and the pressure on land for parking spaces grew. Gardens make up a quarter of the land area of Greater London and front gardens are a further quarter of this. But by 2015, the unintended consequence of reducing streetcar parking was that over half were paved, an increase of 36% with devastating effects from flooding, increase in temperature to biodiversity and wildlife loss. We have to remember that the loss of one front garden may not seem to be so much, but it contributes to the steady loss of space to hard surfacing as the variety of planting in front gardens vanishes. And it's not just our front gardens. When it comes to our city streets, we need to roll back the tide of impermeable surfaces. The need for more sustainable drainage is now widely recognised internationally and embedded in our national and local planning systems, including the Mayor's London Plan. The post-pandemic drive to make cities radically more pedestrian friendly is not surprising. Many European cities have identified the benefits of regulating vehicular prominence and promoting walkable public realm. And this is also happening in London. Publica, a London-based urban design and public realm practice, have been commissioned by the City of London to develop a single public realm vision for the streets and spaces of the city's bank. And the Strand and Marble Arch, and to suggest positive ways in which the public realm could be improved and upgraded to accommodate anticipated future growth. Their completed pedestrianisation of Bond Street, one of the most famous shopping streets in London, relied on recreating the strong identity through the detailing and material palettes. But the drive to pedestrianise must be matched with an intention to reduce motor traffic. This is not just important for reducing climate impact, but goes to the improving the security and air quality of streets and neighbourhoods, in turn creating more space for people of all walks of life to thrive. But once again, lockdown has compounded this need. Car-free cities are now the goal for many major metropolitan cities. And from October 2021, Transport for London announced that the city's existing central London ultra low emission zone would expand to create a single larger zone. These positive and practical changes are being matched with aspirational visions of car free cities. As with all major changes in culture, the power of the imagination reinforces the nuance need for change. Design plays a role, not just in achieving the aims we set ourselves, but also projecting what we can hope for beyond those aims. If only it was that simple. Attempts to scale up walking and cycling infrastructure with permanent road closures have pitted car owners against climate activists. For designers and spatial practitioners, the debate over car-free streets has underscored an uncomfortable truth for the profession. Tackling the climate crisis will require not just planters and bollards, but a deep reimagining of the space and land use. In May, the UK government rolled out low traffic neighbourhoods as part of the £250 million investment to promote cycling and walking. For some climate activists, the hope was that the, these LTNs would result in less car usage and eventually a car-free city altogether. While pedestrianisation efforts in London poll well, there has been a vocal minority opposing the efforts. When environmental restrictions are implemented as quick fixes, without providing credible solutions to the disruptions they cause, problems emerge. 
And in London, the LTNs are perceived as simply shifting work and costs onto individuals and small business owners. Their voices shouldn't be dismissed as if they were climate change denial. It is the responsibility of policymakers and built environment practitioners to include their concerns when making plans for green transition. And green mobility strategies must go beyond addressing the needs of the individual white collar commuters and expand their scope to include groups such as families, aging residents, people with disabilities and local businesses. Making sure taking climate action does not translate into additional work and costs for them requires an approach rooted in sharing equipment, spaces and resources. And a true and fair decarbonisation process will require forms of coordination and cooperation that reimagine genuine investment and participation in public urban spaces. That means design and planning that can bring on board those who are typically left out of the conversation. The shared issues of climate change needs, shared solutions and infrastructures. So far, we've talked about inclusivity and belonging in terms of buildings, streets and neighbourhoods. But what does designing a sense of belonging mean on a national scale, on a scale of infrastructure? And how do we include those voices typically left out at a national level? In 2015, I was made commissioner for the National Infrastructure Commission in the UK. And from day one, I knew that making design central to the commission's work had to be my focus. As we've seen, design has the ability to empower communities, bring people together and change the way we live. And in 2017, I launched a call for young designers to join the panel that would be tasked with figuring out how to demonstrate and enact this ability. Three years later, we achieved consensus at government level that design integrity needs to be at the heart of all national infrastructure. As a result of our work, we have been able to move design up the agenda for infrastructure projects. It's a significant step forward to finally have a national infrastructure strategy, which translates as government backing for our recommendation for all major national infrastructure projects to have a board level design champion and be supported by design panel. This decision will help ensure schemes are built sustainably to a high standard, look beyond their core function to add value to communities and the natural environment. In turn, it will enlist the power of design to help create infrastructure that works for everybody. The focus on climate, people, places and value has permeated into many of our reports. And the next step for Cities programme takes that discussion to a national level with practical help for cities to, to deliver strategic integrated infrastructure plans. And in London, there is much work being done on a recovery plan. The Good Growth by Design Recovery Roundtable series invited mayors, design advocates and other external experts to discuss how London's built environment can help respond to the global health crisis and its ensuing social and economic impacts. Over eight sessions, more than 100 experts from the public, private community and civic sectors examine the most pressing challenges that London faces today. And a summary of the key insights and findings of these roundtables seeking to provide a clear set of actionable steps for how London can recover in the medium to long term was produced with a 10 point action plan. So all action and no words. To wind down and recap, my overriding message here is that good design has the power to bring people in at all scales. If it is devised as a result of earnest listening, then size or scope becomes secondary to what design can achieve. The recipe for building inclusive places remains the same, whether you are designing a civic space, a residential scheme, or a national-wide infrastructure system. All of this is now being acknowledged, that design can help address the demands of a growing population sympathetically and sustainably. But what is arguably still lagging behind is inclusivity on an advocacy level. And this is something we must now focus more on. In 2019, I was honoured to be included in the Queen's New Year's list, receiving an OBE for services to design advocacy. And these are two words that are vitally important to me. I've already spoken at length about why design is important, but I've always matched its significance with the role of advocacy. 
And it brings me full circle to my upbringing. The way I grew up wasn't for everybody, but it taught me that reaching beyond the nuclear family could mean providing a support structure that gave more independence to children and parents alike, particularly mothers who wanted to go out to work. And as de demographics of our world change and we have to deal with things like growing racial inequality an ever increasing aging population and women becoming equal players in the global workforce, we have to rethink our stereotypes. Advocacy is the most powerful way to build inclusivity. Advocacy and empowerment go hand in hand. And unless you are born with a natural inclination to empower yourself, it's difficult to fight for the values you believe to be crucial in your profession. So it needs to be a discipline we encourage in young designers and architects in both education and practice. As the mature generation, we must take responsibility for helping industry newcomers to develop the skills they need, such as negotiation skills, how to present to colleagues and clients and how to network and how to effectively talk about their work and ideas. I'm hugely encouraged by women in my own practice who have helped set up the Architects Climate Action Network a group of young built construction professionals that has emerged as a protagonist in the profession's response to the climate emergency. The other has been instrumental in putting together a design guide to reducing embodied carbon for the London Energy Transformation Initiative, a network of over a thousand built environmental professionals that are working together to put London on the path to zero carbon future. There are others, Pooja Agwal, an associate of the Quality of Life Foundation, and along with Joseph Henry, have set up Sound Advice. Sound Advice creates short quotes and tips on social media and that they are coupled with music, which are designed to be an alternative to the academic way in which inequality is usually discussed. We found that discussions can be too theoretical and academic, and we wanted to create a space where we could be more reactive and explore the visceral and human experience of inequality in the built environment, says Pooja. This is positive progress and goes hand in hand with the credence that, being, that is being given to design advocacy through the industry and nationwide awards and recognitions. Yet we must always strive to provide more support and to work to create more formalized frameworks for educating a young and talented workforce on the importance of the idea, promotion and design activism. Their challenges certainly do look different to what ours were once were, but the recipe for affecting change remains the same. It's about forging relationships and leadership without invitation, creating debate, even if it's uncomfortable, and allowing yourself to stare head on into adversity with authority and integrity. And we need to start to encourage that next ger generation to get involved with the bigger questions of the day. And at the National Infrastructure Commission, I've helped to set up the Young Professionals Panel to give a voice to those who I think will know better than anybody the challenges that we will face over the next 50 years. We had 13 places and over 500 young people applied to become part of the National Infrastructure Commission's Young Professionals Panel, and that's because they knew that they were able to change policy and, and really have the opportunity to shape government policy. And many of the London boroughs are creating their own youth parliaments and youth mayors, something that I think we have to encourage the world over. So the good news is, that if anybody has the ability to navigate and adapt to a changing and highly challenging new environment, it is architects and urban designers. We are adaptable, inventive and imaginative problem solvers who can multitask and make decisions quickly. And what we have to do is to start to analyze what we're good at and learn how to apply it much earlier on in the process. When an external force as unrelenting as this virus threatens us communally, it forces us to equalize, encourages us all to collaborate and demands that we innovate. These three things are also the recipe to improving our built environment through better design, more climate action, and a greater emphasis on well-being. The three are completely intertwined and mutually reinforcing. All the big issues of the day can be mitigated. And that's our collective job for 2021. Thank you.